Hi everyone, thanks for joining in. I'm excited to have Nikki Crutchley joining me today. Hi Nikki. Hi Jackie, thank you for having me. So for those who don't know, Nikki's actually one of our associated authors for Global Girls Online Book Club, so great to have you involved in that this year. And um, we've I've spoken to you before and had you as author for the day before, so welcome back. Thank you. So a little bit about Nikki. Nikki lives in Cambridge, New Zealand with her husband, two daughters and her dog Scout. She has worked in libraries in New Zealand, Ireland and England and now works as a freelance proofreader in between writing. Having loved writing when she was younger, Nikki got more serious about it seven years ago and started writing flash fiction, which is short, short fiction, around 300 words. Um, she has self-published three books, all of which are small town crime mysteries. And her latest book is In Her Blood, which I've got, I've got a proof copy oh, here. So, <laughs> so it's slightly different than your yeah. copy there, but and it's disappearing as well. <laughs> but um just wondering if you want to start off by telling us a bit about In Her Blood. Yeah, so uh, In Her Blood is a story about two sets of sisters and it's set over two different timelines. So um, in the present, Jack is coming home because her sister Charlie is missing. Uh, and in the past timeline, we have Lisa and Paige and it's told through the point of view of Lisa and it's the lead up to the disappearance of Paige. Uh, so all the, all the action, I guess, takes place at the Gilmore Hotel and that's where Lisa and, and Paige live. Uh, it's, uh, it no longer works as a hotel. It's just Lisa Page and their and their mother Iris. Uh, so yeah, all of the all of the action takes place, and I guess it's just Jack working to find Charlie um, and trying to see if there's some kind kind of connection with this old hotel. But uh, it's a psychological thriller, mm. uh, but it's a book about obsession and and grief and, and sisters. Yeah, and I found, yeah, I like the two timelines in that and found it wanting to keep reading to find out yeah. what happened. Yeah, that's the aim with those, with those two timelines. I mm. find that when I write them, I wrote it for my last book as well, To the Sea. And I just think it's, um, even though it's quite hard to write, I, I think for the reader, it, it keeps the page turning, which, yeah. is, the aim, which is the aim for mm. psychological thrillers. Mm. So how do you go about writing two timelines? Do you write them separately or? Um, quite messily, like mm. there's no real plan. And I do start off um, writing kind of in order, as I would, I went Charlie, Jack, Lisa, kind of like that. Mm. But I did find, I do plan a little bit my books, but not, not quite strictly, not mm. chapter by chapter. And I found as I was writing maybe Lisa's chapters in the past, I kind of thought, oh, I want to explore that with her, that with her, and that with her. And I found myself jumping ahead with her chapters and, and writing her chapters. Because for um, In Her Blood, the past chapters and the present chapters are quite separate. Mm. So I, I, I told Lisa's story and, and in the present, I told, I told Jack's story. So that was quite easy. Uh, I, probably the hardest bit was just um, weaving them together. So yeah. with all the reveals and the twists, kind of come come at a good time mm, yeah mm. and, and was what was and forward. yeah and what was yeah. the first idea you had for in her blood um it's kind of hard to pinpoint for in her blood i could probably answer that question really easily for all my other books but yeah when, when i wrote to the sea which was my first book with harper collins i got a, a two book deal with them mm. um so i've written to the sea and then i had this two book deal and i almost had to immediately go into writing this other book um, and I didn't have an idea and I never want to be in that position again, going from one out. I think, I think some authors just deal with it and mm. take a month or two off and just have a think, mm. but, um, I'd much rather be thinking about the next book while I'm writing this book. It just, um, it takes the pressure off a bit. So, so in her blood, there were lots and lots of little things. I think I threw lots of stuff away, like had ideas, but I think the sister thing came, um, was one of the first things, mm -hmm. uh, not even the two sets of sisters, it was probably just Jack and Charlie um, at the start. Um, but I was listening to, I listened to lots of podcasts and I was listening to Australian True Crime um, and that's hosted by Emily Webb, I think. Oh yes, right. yeah. Um, and I listened to um, an episode on um, stalking and obsession mm. um, 
and just the whole obsession thing really interested me and not really uh, that male female obsession that mm. you often hear about but more female female yeah. um, and that got me thinking so I had that the obsession thing and I had the two sisters I had the idea of a fire which um, is kind of Jack's backstory but I think everything that brought it together was the setting. Mm. Uh, and, and that's often the case for me. Like setting for my books is, is a, a real big deal. Uh, it's always front and centre. Um, and so I decided to set it uh, at an old hotel. Uh, and I set it, I, I set all my books in fictional places, but they're always inspired by real places. Mm. Uh, so this one, um, so the Gilmore Hotel is actually the Waitomo Hotel Um which is central North Island of New Zealand. Some people might know the Waitomo uh, Caves, the Glowworm Caves, mm. um, quite a big tourist attraction. But the Waitomo Hotel sits on top of the hill in this tiny settlement. Um, there's like a primary school and a petrol station and a campground, and it's a lovely place. Um, I, I actually renamed it Everly in the book, and it, it's not as nice a place <laughs> um, in my book. But Waitomo in real life is really lovely. Um, and Waitomo is about 15 minutes south of where I grew up as a child. So I knew Waitomo Hotel um, when it was a working hotel and mm. it, it was beautiful. Mm. Um, if, if you go online and Google it, it's this beautiful big, big old hotel. Uh, and we used to go there for um, dinner every oh, now and then and mm. um, like maybe twice in my life for mm. a special occasion. And uh, at the end of um, high school, so Form 7, we had our leavers dinner there. Mm. And I even remember back then I, I'd gone off to go to the toilet and got lost and ended up down a, a back hallway or something. And even then I thought there was a definite feel feel to the place. Yeah. So I, I decided on that. Um, so it's been closed for quite a few years now. Um, and there's um, lots of articles online saying that it's haunted and things like that. So all of that just made it the perfect mm. place for a, a psychological thriller. But I actually got to um, go over, go and look inside. So um, at the time, uh, we I think we were just coming out of one of our lockdowns um, and they were clearing out furniture and things like mm. that from, from the hotel. Um, and they said I could come and, come and have a look. So a lot of the book, or at least the first draft, was written by them, but it was nice to walk around and have a look and I, I swear there's a feel to the place. I don't yeah. know if I believe in ghosts or anything yeah. like that, but um there's a lot of history to it. It's it's a hundred years old. So mm. yeah, that was that was really good to be able to do that. Yeah. I remember you saying about the Waitoma um hotel and I had wondered if you visited there. Is it like all locked up and everything now? Or like yeah, people it is. normally like can't you can um but there's a big sweeping driveway, pretty much as I explain it in the book. Mm. And you can walk up to the driveway. I think there's people living in the, in the staff quarters. Mm. Um, but you can easily walk around and look in the windows and things mm. like that. Yeah. Mm. No, it must be a little bit creepy, I think. It yeah, it is, like... absolutely. And that was my <laughs> aim for that. I just wanted that little bit of creepiness coming into, yeah. into the book. Yeah. And um, Belinda, um, she said she thinks she might have stayed there 38 years ago. Oh, really? I um, When I started putting it online on, on Facebook and what I was doing, it, a lot of people have stayed there or been out for dinner there. Yeah. Mm, mm. And we do have quite a few people watching. So just wanted to remind people watching, if you do have any questions for Nikki, please type them in comments and I can read them out. Um, Belinda says that your book sounds fabulous. She wonders if you know how your story will end when you begin it. Yeah, I do. Um, so yeah, not, not a huge planner, but it goes to show that I do plan a little bit. I just, I think I just need some kind of direction where mm. I'm heading. So things, even if I plan for things to happen during the book, it can change. Mm. Um, but I just need some kind of direction at the end. Mm. Um, but often all the way through, I think I quite like knowing the climax or in psychological thrillers there's always quite a big climax mm. um which is always fun to write quite action-packed um both of mine have been um but yeah I generally do know the end and even going into it when I start writing part of me knows that maybe it's going to change but just mm. for me when I start the book it's n nice to have a direction to mm. go in yeah mm. And um, Kim wonders what you do when you find things aren't connecting. Um, I think this is where my kind of planning organising bit comes in. So when I write, um, I, norm I normally think about the book a good 
four, five, six months before mm-hmm. I actually start writing. So I find all my problems, um, I come across then in that kind of thinking period. So it's not often I get stuck, um, but often um, in the editing process, when when the book gets passed on to my publisher. Um, so In Her Blood had very heavy structural edits, mm-hmm. um, which I was expecting. Um, I wasn't totally happy with, with the first draft. Um, so God bless editors. Uh, so I had to do huge rewrites there. Um, so I cried <laughs> for the start. And then um, it was it was just very stressful. And then yeah. you realise, um, just when you get um, structural edits, no, mm. every author will know, like, it's a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> and obviously don't handle it very well. Um, but within 24 hours, you've had a, had to think about it. And, you know, everything they give you, 98% mm. of the time, I feel, is um, their, all their knowledge is amazing editors. Mm. Um, and so you just look at it bit by bit. Um, I had to remove quite, I removed quite a few characters from the story, um, a few subplots. Um, I think I deleted 30,000 words um, oh. uh, from those initials, which is about a third of the book. Yeah. Uh, and I laugh about it now. Mm. But um, yeah, so it was tough. But um, in the end, it makes for a, a better book. Mm. And what, what sort of things have you been able to do to promote your book? Um, so with Harper Collins, uh, so I had three self published books. Mm. Um, yeah, 2017, 18, and 20, I think, I self published. Um, so it was really lovely getting a, um, a, a publisher and a publicist mm. and things like that because I never really had that stuff for self-published, mm. um, my self-published books. Um, so I'm published here in New Zealand and Australia. Uh, so I do things like this, lots of um, uh, social media stuff, and I've had radio interviews and things like that. Mm. So, yeah, it's been so good. And and even without your publicist telling you, it pops up in magazines and, you know, friends send you the Women's Weekly because you've yeah. been reviewed in there. So it's so lovely just comparing it to being self-published where you kind of do all that all that stuff yourself. So mm. that's been lovely. Mm. Yeah. And have there been, I know um, in Australia there's quite a few writers and readers festivals. Have you been able to be involved in any of them yet? Um, not yet. I've, yeah, I've, um, I've probably got some news coming, but I can't talk about yeah. that yet. Okay, we'll <laughs> um, wait to over the years, hear that. Um, but even over the years, even self-published in New Zealand, I, I was invited to festivals and things mm. like that, which was really lovely. Mm. Just, um, I mean, sometimes self-published um, authors are kind of looked down upon with festivals and things mm. like that, but I find our crime writing uh, community in New Zealand is really, really supportive. Mm. Um, in 2019, I can't remember when it was, um, we had Rotorua Noir, uh, which was a, a crime writing festival that Craig Sisterson put on. Um, so that was amazing, and I got to be a part of that, and I've mm. done a few others. So, yeah, mm. and that's always good, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And... Um, Sharon wonders what you like to read and if you've got any recommendations for us. Oh, I did. I even got some out because <laughs> I knew that question would come. We're um, always so excited I'm, to get recommendations. Yeah, I normally um, read psychological thrillers mm. and crime. And, and just over the last couple of months, I've kind of tried to broaden my horizons a little bit. Um, but I put this one up um, in January on Global Girls Online Book Club. So mm. it's The X-Man's Carnival by Catherine Chidji. And she's a New Zealand author. And um, I don't want to say it's off-putting, but it's <laughs> it's told from the point of view of a magpie, Tama the magpie. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's, um, it's funny and it's um, quite confronting. And, um, yeah, it's just set in this Otago Highland sheep station. Mm. So there's really just this woman and her abusive husband um, and they end up um, kind of adopting, adopting a, a magpie that's fallen oh. out of its nest. And um, and I think magpies mimic anyway, but this mm. one starts to talk. And um, it's the kind of book where you're laughing out loud on a page and then also something quite confronting happens and mm. you're just kind of gasping. And Catherine, is just, she could write about anything and do mm. a, an amazing job. It's so good. Um, and I've just finished... Strange Sally Diamond by Liz Nugent. Uh, Liz is a Irish writer, mm. um, and I absolutely re- recommend all of her books. This one's a little bit hard to talk about because I don't want to give stuff away, but totally recommend yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and the last one was um, Wayward 
Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a proof copy. I think the I think the actual title page looks uh, mm. the cover out in bookshops looks looks more like that. And I love this. And this was a little bit different, just because um, it's told through three three generations of women. Um, there's um, one back in the 1600s, and she's getting tried for witchcraft. Mm. And then there's one in the 1940s, Violet, and then Kate um, in the present. Uh, and they're all related. Um, and it's not a total step away. It's not um, really witchy and, you know, you kind of have to step out of reality kind of thing. There's just a little bit of that. Um, but their, their surname is Wayward. So the yeah. book is called Wayward, and they are Wayward women. Mm. Um and the thing here, it says, they tried to cage us, but a wayward woman belongs to the wild. We cannot be tamed. Oh, okay. um, that and it, like it's so up. good. Yeah. It was really good. I loved mm. it. And at the moment, I'm reading, um, it's actually on my Kindle. Um, it's by Doug Johnston, and it's called The Space Between Us. Okay. Mm. Um, you can't see that very well. Um, but that this is a real step away from me because it's a little bit sci-fi. Okay. Um, but just a little bit. Again, it's not that real step away from reality, mm. you know. Um, but yeah, I'm enjoying it. I'm only mm. about halfway through it. But yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I've been reading. Yeah. No, that's some great recommendations. Yeah. Thanks. Kelly um, wonders if you've had a favourite library to work at. Oh, what a good question. Um maybe i ended up working like i started i did my library studies kind of assuming i'd end up working in public libraries and mm. being surrounded by books and i'd get to take home new books every night or something <laughs> but i actually ended up working in specialist libraries um just kind of by mistake so i worked at um the medical library at waikato hospital oh, okay um yeah. which was really interesting and i was uh, a library assistant there that was my first job mm. while i was studying and I always remember we used to get in all the new books and journals. And um, I was fascinated by the ones that covered um, like autopsies and things oh, okay. like that. Yeah, yeah. surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, but I always thought it was really interesting. And I thought mm. that was something I would have wanted to do. I always used to read Patricia Cornwall's books, her, mm. her case, Scalpita books. And I used to love fl flicking through those, but um, I was never any good at maths or science. Mm. So that was a career that went out the window. Um, and that was good. And then in England, I worked at um, the English Heritage Library, and um, that was just in a beautiful old building. Mm. And I got to, yeah, that that was quite lovely there. Mm. But I also worked at Waikato University, um, and I think that's all. I have a very brief stint at um, the Radiological Protection Institute of Ireland. Okay. That's a mouthful. Uh, but I only worked there for a couple of months while, while we lived in Ireland. But yeah, um, yeah, the the medical hospital, yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, oh, Simona said that she saw you at the Rotorua in Noir. Oh, I'm trying to think when that was, Simone. I'm wondering if I got it was January, mm. maybe 2019. Yeah, mm. yeah. It would be nice if we got to do it again. Mm. Yeah. And Kim wonders what your reading habits were like as a child. Oh, I was a bookworm, born, mm. born a bookworm, absolutely. Mm. Um, yeah, my mum actually, when I was, um, I think I was about three and she lost me for, a, you know, just around the house and she couldn't find me and she was looking for me everywhere. And I was um, hiding down the side of her um, bedside table, jammed in between her bed, um, reading. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, I always have, and I used to love, I oh, still do love um, the Anne of Green Gables series oh, of yes, books. Yeah. I kind of... I kind of credit that to being um, why I started writing. Mm. I just, I have, like, I started reading that um, probably when I was nine or 10. And I, I remember not really being able to understand it, understand mm. it but really loving it. Mm. And even, even now, like 30 years on, I still remember that um, the way you get transported, I guess. I, yeah, I, I very, yeah, I just remember sitting. Um, with one of the Anne books on weekends and mm. just being totally transported, yeah. Mm. And, and, yeah, I, I quite fancied doing that for other people. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, thing, I, I, I remember books from my teens really vividly, even more so than ones I've read. They just really left a mark on mm. me. Well, like, um, so the Anne series, Little Women, um, The Diary of Anne Frank, mm. um, The Power of One. Um, I loved uh, The Book Thief. 
uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, mm. those kind of books. Mm. And, yeah, I've always been a reader. I, yeah, I studied uh, English at, at university. I didn't so much like the studying of books. <laughs> I didn't like the picking apart and, yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, always been a reader. Mm. And have you always thought you'd be a writer? Yeah. I remember probably, if you asked me, from about age seven when I was busy trying to understand Anne of Green Gables books. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I always did. And um, I guess back then <clears throat> it was probably more of a dream than ambition. Mm. I, I didn't really do anything about it. I used to write stories. Mm. And um, I remember my dad brought home my old manual typewriter and I used to bang away on that, writing mm. my stories. So the first book I wrote, book, um, when I was 11, um, it was it was probably a Anne of Green Gables fan fiction, I guess <laughs> you could call it. And I actually found, um, well, it was a couple of years ago now, mum mum and dad were cleaning out their garage. Oh, and I and must have filled um, three or four book, uh, exercise books, mm. you know, notebooks. Um, and I've still got one of them. Um, and it's very, very similar to Anne mm. of Green Gables, a little bit too similar, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah I, I kind of wrote, yeah, up until kind of 14, 15, and then, you know, serious school stuff mm. gets in the way, and then there was uni and travel. But it, all, it had always been at the back of my head that it was mm. something I wanted to do. So mm. I guess just finding the right time and inspiration and things like that to do it. Yeah. yeah. So is there something that pushed you to, to actually do it in the end? I think... Um, I was working at the uni library, uh, and not really enjoying it just because my girls uh, were getting dropped off. I had to drive into Hamilton each day, half an hour or so with mm. mine. They were kind of one and three at the time. Uh, and I used to work four days a week and it, it yeah, it just wasn't really working for me. And I, I kind of hoped that I could work from home somehow and I wasn't really sure what to do. Mm. Um, and I was actually talking to a friend and her sister was a proofreader. And I thought that sounds a little bit like me. Like I was always good at English and things like that. Uh, so I ended up doing a, a diploma in editing and proofreading and ended up quitting my job and uh, working from home. Uh, so that was great. So uh, the girls only had to go to daycare a couple of times a week and things like that. And I think as the girls got older, um, it was probably them starting school. Um, and then proofreading was, was part-time and always has been. Uh, so it was probably just all of those things the girls getting older and and uh, kind of getting off my hands mm. and um, and just yeah time I guess having a bit more time to do it yeah mm. and what about reader feedback that you've had for in her blood is there anything you could share with us anything maybe that oh, touched you um, or it's been so good I think it's uh, even more so than to the sea mm. um, especially on Instagram I've noticed um, the bloggers have been amazing God bless bloggers mm. and groups like yours um, just yeah just very positive feedback and I love there's lots of talk about um, how much they love the setting the the creepy setting mm. and that's what I really set, set out to do um, as I said with all my books setting is is kind of front and center and it's kind of the thing that that anchors all my ideas, um, and there's been lots of um, lots of good responses about uh, the setting, which mm. which is great. Mm. And what are you up to now? Um, so I finished my sixth book uh, kind of mid January, and and sent that off to my agents. Um, so it's on submission at the moment, which mm. is a terribly <laughs> nerve wracking time. Um, and it's only really been a couple of weeks. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's just, just waiting at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but in the last couple of months, I've also had offers from uh, Harlequin, Crime, Harlequin Crime Library, I think it's called, in America. Uh, and they're um, publishing some of my, my backlist, oh, uh, nice. which, is, which is really yeah. exciting. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so my agent, Vicky, she's been wonderful doing doing things like that. Yeah. So while you're waiting on the book that's um, with the publishers at the moment, do you start on something else? or? Yeah, what do you... so, um, so I finished this the sixth one mid-Jan. Yep. And I've had, as I said, I've had an idea because I never wanted to mm. be without an idea, really. Mm. Um, so this, what will be the seventh book, I'm kind of almost ready to start. Okay. I, um, yeah, so I've been thinking about it. Even 
uh, when I was writing in in her blood, I think mm. I even had the idea. So I've been thinking about it for a long time. And for me, the the more time, the better, mm. um, just because it kind of gets rid of any kinks and things like that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm really bad at starting to write a new mm. book. Like, yeah, a lot of people, when you, um, they ask writers for advice, writers say, just start. It doesn't matter where you start, just get it. But I really need the perfect, and it's not perfect, but... For me, at the time, I just want the perfect beginning, and it, mm. and it takes a lot to do that. I've actually just written the blurb for it. I find it kind of, you know, just a back cover blurb, what yeah. it would look like when it's published, just mm. to, to get my head around it. Um, and actually, yesterday, I took um, my husband and, and two girls and my dog, uh, and it's going to be set kind of... Uh, in a small settlement again, um, but a dam, uh, a dam plays a big part in it. Okay. So um, very, very close to me, we have the Caterpillar dam, mm, okay, um, and dams, yeah. dams scare me quite mm. a lot. I think they, I think they're really creepy, mm. um, just terrifying. Um, and and we also went to Arapuni, which is uh, about half an hour from where I live, and there's also a dam there and a, a huge swing bridge um, that goes across this kind of raging raging river mm. um so that was all all good inspiration and took took lots of photos so yeah um the cogs are turning mm. yeah. oh, it sounds good and exciting yeah mm. well thanks so much for chatting with me it's been great to talk to you again it's and great. i'll be Thank looking you. out for what you're up to and more books yeah. that you're recommending to us yes. and i'll keep you all posted <laughs> i love doing that yeah and thanks for those who joined in and asked some questions Great. Thanks for having me, Jackie. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.